my name is Ken Armstrong. I'm the president and CEO of North Arrow Minerals. And the purpose of this presentation is to provide an update on North Arrow's activities through the summer of 2014, and in particular, the work that we've been doing on our Kilalugak and Piku diamond projects. As with any presentation of this nature, it's important to note that uh, we'll be making some forward-looking statements, so uh, please familiarize yourself with the, uh, the content of the slide. So the opportunity that North Arrow presents right now is really one that we think checks a lot of the boxes that one might want to see for a, an investment opportunity in the diamond space. North Arrow has a very experienced team that's had success in exploration and development of diamond projects in Canada and uh, in Africa. We have uh, solid financial backing and having raised over $13 million over the last 18 months at successively higher share prices and have managed to retain an attractive share structure with only 50 million shares outstanding and, uh, and not much of an overhang, only 55 million shares on a fully diluted basis. We've worked to, to leverage the evaluations that we're doing of our projects, and so in particular looking at projects that have seen a fair bit of past exploration but have a very clear path uh, forward in terms of how to evaluate them. We see that in the form of our advanced Kilalugak project where we have a 1500 ton bulk sample of kimberlite that's about to start being processed and I'll take you through that in some detail. In 2013 we also made a new discovery of Canada's newest diamond district in Saskatchewan at our PICU project. We also have five earlier pre-discovery stage projects that we're also evaluating. In terms of our corporate structure, as I mentioned, just right around 50 million shares outstanding and 55 million shares fully diluted. And as at July 31st, we had $7 million in cash available to evaluate our projects. Main shareholders in the company uh, remain largely management as well as uh, Zebra Holdings. Very strong support from, from existing shareholders and some new shareholders to help us uh, pull in the funding required to evaluate our, our projects. In terms of the people involved in the company, as I mentioned, a lot of experience on the board and, and in management with our advisors in terms of exploring for and developing diamond projects in Canada. I won't linger on this slide, but detailed biographies are available on our, our website. And so North Arrow's project portfolio hasn't changed much over the last 12 months. We have seven properties that we're currently evaluating. I'll focus primarily on the Kilalugak project in Nunavut as well as Piku in Saskatchewan. But we also have two projects in the Northwest Territories in the Lac de Gras region. Our redemption project option agreement with Arctic Star is located at the west end of Lac de Gras and we have a very compelling indicator train. Um, we did do some drilling this past summer and failed to hit Kimberlite, but we uh, believe there are a number of targets there that remain to be tested and we'll be taking a look at. And with our Lac de Gras joint venture with Dominion Diamonds, we'll be looking forward to uh, advancing that project in 2015 as well. And then we also have some earlier stage projects at Mellon Lux in Nunavut and our Tamiskaming joint venture with Stornoway Diamond Corporation. But as I mentioned, we'll spend the bulk of this presentation talking about the Kilalugak project. It really has been sort of the flagship project for North Arrow since we turned our eye towards diamond exploration right around two years ago. The project is one where we have an option to earn an interest from Stornoway Diamond Corporation. Basically, we can earn an 80% interest by completing a mini bulk sample and getting the resultant diamond parcel valued. And then Stornoway will retain the right to buy back 20% to bring their interest up to 40% by paying us three times those costs. So a very fairly typical option arrangement for our industry. And the reason for the bulk sample is, uh, is because of the main Kimberlite at the project called Q1-4. to Q1-4 is one of uh, a number of kimberlites that were discovered by BHP in the area of Repulse Bay at the south end of the Melville Peninsula in Nunavut in the early 2000s. Subsequent to that discovery, Stornoway initially had an option and ultimately earned 100% interest in the project and completed some further work. And the bulk of that work was completed on the Q1-4 kimberlite, and it's, it's rather unique and, and somewhat fortuitous because it's the largest of the kimberlites that's been discovered within the project area, and it's also the highest grade in terms of its diamond content. It also then happens to be the closest to the hamlet of Repulse Bay and to Tidewater, and we think that's a very critical point when, when looking at and evaluating Q1-4 as a diamond prospect. 
Shortly after acquiring the option from Stornoway, North Arrow last spring restated an initial resource estimate that Stornoway had published for the Q1 to 4 Kimberlite. That resource is really quite large. It sits at uh, just under 49 million tonnes, grading just over a half carat per tonne, essentially, for a contained diamond resource of 26 million carats. That takes the, the body down to about 205 metres depth. There, it remains open, and there's a target for further exploration that could see us add in the neighbourhood of 14 to, to 16 million tonnes at a very similar grade, down to 300 metres depth. So Q1-4 is a multi-phase kimberlite. Five different phases have been defined in the body. And uh, when looking at where we would collect our bulk sample from, we are collecting it from the A28 phase, which is the eastern limb of the body and is the portion of the kimberlite that's on land. And we have some comfort in collecting the sample there, largely based on the fact that the uh, diamond grade throughout the body is very consistent, as are the characteristics of the diamonds in the current diamond parcel and that we find throughout the uh, Q1 to 4 kimberlite are also very consistent. And so at the, the current level of evaluation, we have some comfort that collecting the bulk sample from the A28 phase where the kimberlite comes to surface on land um, makes a lot of sense and that we'll end up with a, with a usable result. So we collected the bulk sample this year from two areas on the eastern limb of the Q1 to 4 kimberlite in the A28 phase uh, and they're represented by the red ovals on this map. The two green squares that you see are areas where Stornoway collected a little over 20 tons of kimberlite in 2006 and 2007, and that gave us confidence that we knew the kimberlite would come to surface in these areas, and that's why we zeroed in on, on this particular part of the kimberlite. Obviously, if the kimberlite's right at surface, it's easier to sample, and we'll be able to get it, uh, and we're able to get it in a more cost-effective manner. So to collect the, the sample, uh, we slung out a little mini excavator, um, stripped off the overburden and filled one ton mega bags with kimberlite and then slung those bags from the kimberlite to a laydown area uh, near the hamlet of Repulse Bay. Overall, the project went very, very well, and we'll try and show you some of the logistics involved with that, um, just to give you a, a bit of a flavor on how it all went. This uh, air photo just shows the area of the two pits, the central pit and the west pit on July 13th. And so this is essentially the day before the sampling really started in earnest. And in that central pit area, you can see these two sort of windrows of material that have been pushed aside. That's the overburden that was, that was uh, pushed aside to expose the kimberlite. And then there's two cone-shaped piles, and that's the initial uh, portion of the kimberlite that's been piled up and is ready to start filling bags. You can also see the area where we have silt fences and the area of the 2007 sample pit where Stornoway with shovels collected 20 tons. Uh, on August uh, the 13th, um, you can see the development that's happened in the two pit areas. This is the second last day of filling bags. So you can see how the trenches look with the filled mega bags, some of the very last ones uh, before they were slung to town. Um, you can just barely make out the excavator in there. So just to give an idea of what the size and extent of the ultimate trenches were, and really, as we mentioned, it all went very well. And so here's just a, a little video that I'll try and take you through. This should give you some idea of how we collected the sample. And in essence, the kimberlite, once we stripped off the overburden, it was quite easy to dig up. And this is, uh, shows the excavator ripping the kimberlite with a bucket and creating piles, uh, getting them ready to fill the mega bags. Where the kimberlite got a bit harder, we used a frost pick, which uh, really quite easily dug down into the kimberlite and was able to rip it up, and we were then able to fill the bags. The bags were set up on wooden cradles, uh, just basically two by fours that were screwed together. The bags were double bagged and with the aprons put over the edge of the, of the cradles, and then the, the excavator was able to fill them. It was basically six and a third to six and a half scoops, would equal about 2,000 pounds of kimberlite. And uh, when the bags were full, the cradles would be removed and the bags were then tied up with a security seal put on them and get ready for slinging. And the slinging would use the four outer loops of the outer bag and at 2,000 pounds it was kind of the perfect picking weight for the helicopter that we're using. In this shot you can see the helicopter lifting off and taking the uh, sample bag on its way for the uh, six minute one way flight to our lay down area in Repulse Bay and here's how the bags would get put down on the ground in the in the, re, the lay down area and then off the helicopter would go back to the pit and we had perfect balance just about between the bags we were filling and our ability to sling them and at the very end we ended up with 1688 bags and uh, for us actually the, the uh, 
goal was 1,650 at 2,000 pounds per bag. That would give us 1,500 tons, which was our, our goal for collecting the kimberlite. And, and the crew was uh, obviously uh, very happy to reach that goal. It was a, a long, hard program, but the guys did a great job. And we ultimately ended up with 1,688 bags of kimberlite uh, at the laydown site in Repulse Bay. And the bags sat there in Repulse Bay uh, waiting for the annual sea lift to come in. And so uh, other thing I'd just like to point out, our, our budget was about $1.8 million to get the bags to this point, to, uh, to the laydown. And we uh, were basically able to ac uh, accomplish that bang on budget. At the end of August then, um, the annual sea lift did arrive in the hamlet and the bags were transported down to the beach in the community, out to the sea lift and with a big spreader bar that could lift a dozen bags at a time, the bags were lowered into the hold of the ship, transported to Montreal where they've been offloaded and are currently being trucked to Thunder Bay on, on flatbed trucks and the very first samples have arrived at our microlithics laboratory in Thunder Bay and ready for processing. That processing is going to uh, start in the first week of October and we expect it will run for a period of about four months. So that's the program and, and we're, we're very pleased that we felt that was the biggest technical risk is, is collecting any sample or doing any program in the high Arctic is, is very challenging. Um, the program went very well. We're, we're very pleased that we were able to get the full sample size that we wanted to and, uh, and to now have the sample in Thunder Bay ready to start processing is, uh, is, is quite an important milestone for North Arrow. Just taking a step back and thinking about, what, again, why we, we did collect the sample, just a couple of charts that we have been showing. Um, this one shows the, uh, the, the compares the Q1 to 4 uh, resource in terms of the carrot inventory to other more advanced projects as well as some of the existing mines and the inventories that they had when they went into production. And the key takeaway here, it is uh, comparing apples to oranges a bit in terms of, of uh, Q1 to 4 being an inferred level resource, and these more advanced projects certainly have have more certainty in terms of their contained uh, diamond inventory, but at 26 million carats, it's a good number of carats on a global scale for a deposit. It's a big diamond deposit. And similarly, at a half carat per ton, the grade is pretty good too. Not as high as some of the other Canadian deposits, but on a global scale, uh, it's not a bad grade at all to have. And I uh, do like to compare it to the Victor mine in Ontario. De Beers has operated very successfully over the last number of years as being a comparable lower grade kimberlite. Its grade is, is about half of what Q1-4's grade is, and yet it has worked. And it's in a remote area in northern Ontario. It requires about a 100-kilometer road to get to it. But it's worked, and it's worked because of the diamond value of that, of that deposit, which are, or those diamond values are really quite exceptional. And so that leads us to that, that one aspect of Q1 to 4 that we don't have a great handle on yet and is the purpose of the current bulk sample. And that's what value uh, can we ascribe to the diamonds in Q1 to 4. Things that we do know about the current parcel of diamonds that have come from the work that BHP and Stornoway have completed is that the diamonds look pretty, pretty typical of Canadian production. This photo shows uh, a number of the plus 9 DTC stones. So in essence, these, these diamonds would be about 0.2 carats or above. The one diamond in the back is about a half carat stone. And we can see from the, the, the clear stones, there are some that have very nice uh, structures, and they look really quite good. But there's just not enough of them right now for us to be able to, uh, to assess the valuation of those sort of grainer and carater sized stones. And ideally, to do that, we need a parcel of about 500 carats. When we look at the valuation and think, is, is there any possibility for a sweetener, that's where we've been pointing out the fact that there is a population of yellow diamonds in the Q1-4 to 4 kimberlite, and we see a selection of them here in this photograph. And um, these yellows have, have been viewed by, uh, by diamond terrors who've indicated that, yes, they're fully saturated stones, and if they were to carry on into the larger sizes, and if they were to have good crystal forms, they would be considered true yellow fancies. And if they're there, then have a very positive impact on the overall uh, valuation of diamonds from Q1 to 4. Um, when we look at comparables and, and trying to characterize what that positive impact might be, we have been uh, lucky to have uh, uh, the Ellendale mine in production over the last number of years. Ellendale produces over half of the, the world's yellow fancy diamonds and up until recently uh, Tiffany's has had a, an offtake agreement where they've purchased the yellow diamonds from Ellendale and Tiffany's essentially over the last number of years has paid between sort of $4,000 a carat and about $5,500 a carat for the rough yellow production from Ellendale and, uh, and we think really the takeaway from that is that if, if one has a population of yellow stones um, you could be looking at an order of magnitude higher price for the yellow rough than you might for regular commercial goods and of course 
Tiffany with that offtake agreement. They have been marketing their yellow collection and uh, and been creating a market for these stones. Um, and so that's uh, it's a, it's a positive thing when, when looking at the possibility of them being there. So it does also allow us to, uh, in a generic way, kind of model what the impact of a yellow uh, diamond population might be at Q1 to 4. And on, on this uh, diagram, I think the, the main place to look is on the two bars on the left-hand side, which would show that if you had a generic mining operation where, say, 5% of your, your production is coming from yellow fancy diamonds and the remainder are just regular commercial goods and using some average diamond prices, that the takeaway becomes that those yellow stones, even though they're 5% of the production, are almost two-thirds of the overall value, and you can start to get to some pretty robust uh, dollar values per carat for uh, for that sort of operation. Um, and so that's why it makes sense to move forward and evaluate this project. And we really think that, uh, that Q1 to 4 hits a lot of the right notes that, uh, that one likes to look for for an exploration project. It's in a, a jurisdiction in Nunavut where there is a uh, clear path for permitting. Uh, Agnico has, uh, has been has permitted and put into production the Meadowbank mine and are on the, the path towards doing the same thing with the Meliodine uh, mine. There's a settled land claim in Nunavut. Um, and then also a really critical thing is, is the fact that this kimberlite essentially sits on tide water. Uh, the photo on the right here shows uh, the area uh, last fall before we collected our bulk sample where the, uh, the, uh, the, the bulk sample was collected on the Q1 to 4 kimberlite. And if you uh, can look closely in the background in the center of the slide on the water, that's right where the, the hamlet of Repulse Bay is. And you can actually see the annual sea lift when it was in at the community in uh, early September of 2013. So we're, we're right there and there's, there is a history of, uh, of successful mine development in the high Arctic of Canada for deposits that are located on tidewater and I think one can point out the Polaris mine and the old uh, Nana Civic mines as, as examples of that. Um, in addition, the Q1 to 4 kimberlite as we touched on is a, is a large tonnage resource. It's only down, been tested down to about 200 meters depth. Um, it has a good grade at just over half carat per ton. And then there's blue sky. Um, there certainly is room to expand the deposit below 200 meters. And then there's also another 15 kimberlite bodies in the project area that, that uh, ultimately will require further evaluation as well. So with a positive diamond uh, valuation, which we would expect to, uh, to get in uh, the first quarter of 2015, we'll uh, really be in a position to move very quickly towards getting a preliminary economic assessment done and getting this project onto a development path. And, and uh, th we just think there's not very many projects in any commodity, let alone just diamond projects, where it's a very clear path right now with a positive result from the valuation uh, of, of the bulk sample. So um, that's uh, uh, an update on, on the Kilalugak, and in particular, the Q1 to 4 Kimberlite. Uh, 1,500 ton sample is, is arriving presently at our laboratory in Thunder Bay. We'll be processing it, recovering diamonds, and getting them valued. Uh, and we expect that will take in the neighborhood of four months. Um, with the valuation, it might be more like five months. So kind of late February or March of 2015. And we're going to be able to do all of that work for a total budget, and we're on budget to, to accomplish this, of about $3.7 million. So considering the location of the project, uh, we think that's another plus and actually underscores the uh, cost savings of working on a, on a project and uh, on a deposit that, that is located in such, a good, uh, in such a good area and close to a community and close to Tidewater. So that was Q1 to 4 in our bulk sample, as I mentioned, and, and the project really was a focus for us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when we, we first ramped up North Arrow as a diamond exploration company, but we did know that that was going to take time. Big, big samples and big programs take a while to plan and to, to finance uh, and to, to move through their, their evaluation process. And another project that we acquired uh, last year to sort of help us fill that gap was the PICU project in Saskatchewan. And, uh, and it's proven to be very, very successful for us as well. It is presently a joint venture with uh, our partner Stornoway Diamond Corporation. It's 80% uh, to North Arrow and 20% to Stornoway on, an, on a participating basis. But last year in June of 2013, uh, North Arrow drilled two well-defined target areas that Stornoway had identified. We hit Kimberlite in uh, nine out of 10 drill holes. And in one body called PK-150, we recovered enough Kimberlite to test for diamonds. And uh, last fall and early November, we reported some initial diamond results that were, were really quite positive and show that this, uh, this project is, is worth 
worth advancing. Uh, as a reminder of where it's located, it's about halfway between the community of Larange and the border of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. We're about 200 kilometers northeast of the Fort Alicorn Kimberlites, so it's a totally new area where previously Kimberlites were not known, and it does represent a new discovery. The diamond results, as we reported last fall, just here's a photograph of the, uh, the plus 0.85 millimeter stones from a 200 and approximately 210 kilogram sample of PK150 that was uh, evaluated by caustic fusion, as well as the diamond results. And the takeaway that we've uh, been trying to get across is the fact that we did recover um, 23 diamonds greater than 0.85 millimeters, uh, which end up with a resultant total recovery sample grade for the sample of, of over 1.3 carats per ton. And it's a very, very positive result. The diamonds look very good, as you can see in this photograph. And the other way to sort of evaluate this data and compare it is uh, a slide looking at the, uh, the size, frequency, distribution of the microdiamond data set. And here's a plot showing the PK150 microdiamond results in red in comparison to the initial microdiamond results from the Kelvin Kimberlite reported by Kennedy Diamonds in black. And in green is the, the initial microdiamond results from the CH6 Kimberlite of the Chidiac project of Peregrine Diamonds. And so really uh, still showing PK150 in comparison to these, uh, these two projects because they really do represent uh, the two highest profile exploration plays in Canada. And in essence, on a diagram like this, what you want to see is a very flat line. As flat, the flatter it is, the better, because it means there's the potential for there to be coarser stones. Because on the on the uh, the x-axis, as the diagram moves out to the right, um, you're getting out to coarser and coarser uh, diamonds. And uh, and so in this case, it shows that there's a real potential that there could be some larger diamonds there. So in light of the positive result, one of the uh, options obviously would be to go back and drill some more, but we have taken a bit more of a patient view, and that's because when we look at, at the development of the PICU project, Stornoway uh, initially identified these targets with a single till sample that had two pyrope grains in it, and uh, they went and followed that up to find two target areas called the South Piku Train, Indicator Mineral Train, and the North Piku Trains. And it was at, these were the targets that North Arrow drilled in 2013 with 10 holes. As I mentioned earlier, we hit Kimberlite in nine of those drill holes, including the PK-150 body at the head of the South Piku Indicator Train. These trains were, were defined by till sampling completed by Stornoway, but obviously once they, they zeroed in and, and knew that they were developing trains, that's where the bulk of the till sampling occurred. Although they, they started with a single till sample that had two pyropes, we can see on the eastern side of the property that there are a number of till samples that also have one or two, or you can just tell by the size of the circles, you see essentially the number of grains. And there's a number of positive samples out to the east, and they would not normally be uh, considered to have been derived from where we know the Kimberlites are located at North Piku and South Piku. So the joint venture decided to go back this summer and rather than drill right away to do more till sampling and see if we couldn't define some more indicator trains. So in June of 2014, we collected 440 odd till samples. And although the results are still coming back, what we do see so far is really a best case uh, result. We are defining at least two and possibly up to five new indicator trains in the east and southern parts of the property. And this only represents about 60% of the results from, uh, from the June program. We have gone back this fall and late September and October now. We're, we're collecting another 120 or 150 or so till samples to really try and prove up these indicator trains. And our plan will then be to drill these new targets in the winter of 2015. Uh, we have a permit in hand, so we're, we're already in permitted to, to drill next winter, and we have felt that this is the, the prudent way to move forward. We really looked at the results from 2013 as a, as a proof of concept, where we showed that in this area of Saskatchewan, if you're drilling uh, well-defined indicator mineral targets, um, you can have a very good success rate with the drill, and that's why we didn't feel it made sense to rush back up and just start blindly drilling geophysical targets. Instead, we're going to combine this new till sampling data with our geophysical data sets, and ideally that will give us uh, the best chance at success with the next round of drilling, because we already know that the uh, that these kimberlites can have some quite high diamond counts, and, and uh, it, uh, it all leads for us and for North Arrow uh, to the first half of 2015 as being a very exciting time. 
We're going to be just finishing up the processing of the Q1 to 4 bulk sample, initially getting a, a sample grade result, ideally uh, getting a, a look at what the diamonds might look like, but ultimately the most important piece of information to come out of that, uh, that sample will be the valuation of the diamonds. And when we have that, it'll be giving us an indication of what the diamond value could be for the Q1 to 4 kimberlite, and if it's positive, as I mentioned, we could be rolling very quickly into uh, preliminary economic assessment, and then ultimately uh, getting on to the development track. And then also in the winter of 2015, we'll be drilling in Saskatchewan and, and ideally discovering more kimberlites at Piku and uh, ideally more diamond-bearing kimberlites. And we will also be continuing with our evaluation of our projects in, in the Northwest Territories at Redemption and Lac de Gras. And we did do small programs on each of the Lux Mel and Tamiskaming projects, and those results are also forthcoming. So there's a lot of news for us moving forward, and really importantly, North Arrow is funded to complete this work, and we should be in a good position to be able to report to the market some pretty exciting news in the early part of 2015. So that's a quick update on North Arrow and our activities through the summer of 2014. Thanks very much for, for listening, and here are our contact details if uh, you have any further questions.